will invite Jill and Gabrielle to introduce themselves further um, down the line when they speak. We recognise that issues pertinent to EDI can be triggering to individuals due to lived experience um, of such topics. If you find something triggering and you would find it helpful to have a conversation with somebody, uh, then the Reverend Andrew Webb has um, kindly offered to be our chaplain today. And you will note on the screen his phone number. We'll bob that also into chat so that if you need to speak during um, one of the breakout sessions, you should still be able to access his number. So finally, it's my pleasure uh, to invite Andrew, who is acting as our chaplain and part of the coordinating team for Positively Rural, to lead us in our opening devotion. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Andrew Webb. I'm the Rural Lead for the Yorkshire West Methodist District and part of Positive Rural Planning Team. Um, I live and work in North Yorkshire, which is a great privilege. And I delight in the way that so much of what I see around me reflects um, the stories in the Gospels that I read and the teaching of Jesus, um, sheep and hills and lakes and farming. Um, so much of Jesus' ministry was spent in that rural context. And yet amongst the beauty that I see and delight in, I also recognise the challenges of um, rural life. Um, and I remember the way that Jesus reached out to the isolated, to those in poverty, to the hurt and the forgotten, a ministry which is so important um, to share in our rural communities today and something that we can bring into this um, conversation about EDI. And I'm just going to share a prayer which comes from the uh, Methodist Guide, the, the Methodist Handbook on um, Strategy, Justice, Dignity and Solidarity, and it comes from, written by Mark Slaney. Let's pray. God of all, praise and thanks be yours through Jesus, who at his birth received visits from shepherds and foreigners, who invited fishermen and tax collectors to be his disciples who taught us not to judge others, who healed a Roman servant and a Canaanite's daughter, who was happy to be counted as one who ate and drank with sinners, who challenged religious leaders for neglecting justice, mercy and faith, who sets before us an example of the inclusive mission and ministry of the gospel. Cleanse us by your Holy Spirit, and as we reject and resist discrimination, May we truly love and serve you as we love and serve all. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Jill, who's going to lead the first part of our webinar. Hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to start with a big apology to anybody that turned up to the last one of these because I was in a bit of a weird place in my life and very, very uncharacteristically, I completely missed the starting time and I felt so awful about it. So thank you if you come back and trusted me to be here this time. Um, and if you know somebody who didn't come back because that happened last time, and if you find it helpful, which I hope you will, then please do feel free to share the recording and to tell them it was worth coming after all. <laughs> so apologies. Apologies for that. So I am Jill Marsh. I am a Methodist minister. I've just become a new super, so I'm learning all of that. Um, I'm not a rural expert, so it's great to be amongst you who are and to have with us Gabrielle. Um, seeing Luke on the screen reminds me that we met each other when we were doing city centre work. And so the wonderful thing that is Methodist ministry <laughs> sends you here, there and everywhere. Um, and uh, I have now got um, a section of the circuit that I'm uh, super in where, the, where it is all rural. We're looking for a rural specialist in stationing. Um, and I'll be there this afternoon. So I, I have got little bits of experience of rural, but I'm not a rural specialist. My last role was, as somebody uh, explained, to, to help the church to put into practice um, the equality, diversity and inclusion work. So I'm not going to screen share. I hope that's all right. Um, but I don't find it all that useful to screen share. It means I can't see people and... Um, you've got the link to the website. So I'm gonna tell you what's in there, talk a little bit about why I think it's important for every everywhere in the UK and the world for that matter, um, and explain a bit about what's in it and then um, you'll be very welcome to ask any questions. So it was lovely to hear Andrew, first of all, use this um, 
use a guide to the strategy. It's a little booklet which is freely available online from the uh, publishing house. Um, it does set out really well, I think, what this strategy is about. Um, I don't know how many of you've worked in other settings where you've heard of EDI and are trying not to use abbreviations too much, but generally speaking in the wider world, this work is called Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And some of the work that we've been doing um, in the Methodist Church with our ecumenical partners um, is about the law, uh, because there are laws about um, discrimination and churches are not exempt from them, so we have to be really careful that we um, keep the law because we believe those are good laws um, but we believe they're good laws because we believe the theology of all this is that God has made every single one of us um, equal and made in God's image and we don't always live that out so in very basic terms I think that this work is about love your neighbour as yourself and um, we all say that we all say everybody's welcome but very often we find it really hard to put that into practice so I wanted to just invite you for a minute to think about that idea, which is a thoroughly Christian and biblical idea, that everybody is made in the image of God. Everybody is made in the image of God. Um, because what that means then is that when we meet anybody, uh, there's something in them that can teach us of God, something in them which um, puts us in touch with God, helps us to value um, who God is, helps us to recognize what God has done in the human race. Um, and if at any point we, or anybody else for that matter, disregard somebody, um, exclude them, because of something that we think is not um, acceptable about them or whatever, we are sort of cutting ourselves off from that possibility of learning more um, about God. So that's where the strategy starts from, really, that God has made us all, that God has made us all in God's image, that we are all um, able to be saved, that we're all in need of repentance, every one of us, um, that we can all be saved by God, that we can all know we're saved and that we can all know we're saved to the uttermost. And hopefully that's what churches are living out. Um, whenever, you, well, you know this, but whenever you talk to somebody about um, how welcoming their church is, they will always say it's welcoming because they have always felt welcomed there, <laughs> which is why they are there. <laughs> um, and it's a difficult conversation to have with churches because, um, I, I, and I'm going to just tell you a story. When I was in a city and I was in a city, um, that city was celebrating Gay Pride Week and we were asked if we would host um some of the events and being a Methodist minister I said well I need to talk to the church council about it and the church council said we are very um very uh, determined that everybody should feel welcome in this church and so yes we would definitely like to host these things and they said anyway we're gay friendly aren't we um, now I don't know what your church would say about that but um I just said to them actually we don't have anybody openly gay in our congregation so it seems to me that given the population um if we were being openly gay friendly there would be gay people who felt that it was a friendly church and would be able to join us and to, to join in so we have to think not just are we do we believe we're being friendly do we believe we're treating people well do we believe we're being respectful do we believe that we are welcoming of all people but do of those other people that don't come at the moment <laughs> do they experience that when they come in um, in the middle of the booklet and i will hold it to the screen there's a diagram for people that like diagrams uh, some people hate them some people or prefer them and there's nothing new in it in a way uh, we've got there the, the cross at the center we've got the idea from the bible that life together in christ is a full life that we're richer together um, that we get a taste of heaven when we share communion with all people um, so we want as a church to be um, radiating if you like justice and dignity um, we want people to know that they're welcomed that they're valued um, but the thing for me that's most important about that I'm going to hold it a bit closer is the idea that it's through this that God works that God works through all of this stuff so the Methodist Church um, and other churches that have chosen to use this strategy as well you know has come to the conclusion through the work we've done through conference through our discernment of all of this that actually God has always um, 
chosen to reveal God's self to people through our experiences of encounter with each other. So that's where it all starts. Um, I've got to keep my eye on the time. <laughs> um, I hope that, that made some sense. Um, I had, when I was in the connectional job, quite a lot of emails and phone calls from people who said, well, it's all very well um, in towns and cities because you're meeting diverse people all the time, but we don't meet anybody who's different in our place. Um, and I'm just going to ask you to think about that for the moment, for the places where you are. Um, because people literally said to me, there isn't any diversity where we are. Um, and I think it doesn't take long to work out that what people are thinking about in that particular respect is we don't have diversity of skin colour. That was nearly always when we got chatting. That was nearly always what they meant, um, that everybody was white and they didn't know any black people. Um, now, I don't know where about where you are. I know that increasingly that's changing across the whole country. Um, I think it is a challenge for rural people. Um, friends of mine who were black went on holiday, are black, went on holiday to Devon. Um, felt people were really friendly while they were in the shop, you know, buying things in the corner shop and so on. We were really pleased by how friendly well, people were, in fact. But they stayed for two weeks. And in the second week, they started to get comments from more than two people apparently there were three different people that said to them you haven't moved down here have you or it's lovely to see you but I'm assuming you don't live around here and I know it's quite hard to put these things into words but I trust these friends uh, completely and they said although they couldn't convey it very well without being a good actor the whole tone was it's fine to visit but we don't want our village changed by having people from different places arrive here so I don't know I'm not a rural person that may or may not be true where you are the one time I was minister of a rural village and um, I have to say I was so proud of them and um, because they were the ones that were always saying to me who lived in the city you know can you help us understand for example Islam you know we keep hearing about Islam on the television we don't know any Muslims we don't have any Muslims in our village there's only chance you could bring some Muslims for us to chat to and get to know a bit so that when we hear people being anti-Muslim, we've got some experience to go on. Um, and so I was really, really chuffed that they took that deliberate um, approach. Let's, as Christians, be the ones who are seen to be welcoming and learning. And that's what this strategy is asking for, really, that we all learn um, through our respect for other people. So what I wanted to point out at the beginning of our time together, and um, Gabriella will help us think about this a bit later on as well, is that the strategy for justice is called that because we know um, that everybody should be equal in God's eyes, but actually we're, they're not um, in society. So we're asking for justice. We know there's diversity. Um, you really do only have to be in a room of people to realise there is some diversity. We're all we're not clones, <laughs> so we are all different in terms of our curly hair or our beards or whatever it is that we've got. <laughs> we've got. Um, we know there's diversity, but this is about remembering that God gives dignity to each person and that that's not ours to take away. Everybody's dignity comes from being made in the image of God, created by God, saved by God, loved by God. So actually, um, that's why it was called dignity rather than diversity. Diversity is a fact of life but we wanted the church to treat people with dignity. And the one that caused the most debate uh, on this title was solidarity. <laughs> um, some people associate it with trade unions and really hated it. Um, some people associated it with trade unions and really loved it. <laughs> so that word caused a lot of controversy. Um, but if you remember, it's equality, diversity and inclusion. And we were very unsure about inclusion. Um, if inclusion means that we reflect God's inclusive love for everybody, then hallelujah, and let's live that way. If it means we are deciding whether or not to include other people, that shows that we haven't got this right, if you sort of mean, from, from a Christian point of view. We're assuming it's ours to decide whether or not to include other people. So I'm always a bit worried when I hear the word inclusion or inclusive until I'm sure that what they mean is that God's love is inclusive and therefore everybody is assuming that everybody has a place uh, in the church um, if they want it um, and around the communion table if they want it. So that's where the justice, dignity and solidarity came from, um, that exact title. 
Um, there's lots of stuff in the strategy. If you've had a chance to have a look later on, there's a, a little section where you can ask any questions you want about strategy. I'll shut up in a minute and then you can fire your most urgent questions now. There are lots of bits in it, um, but it aims, it's got three really massive aims. Um, I was only in the role two and a half years and everybody knew that would be the very beginning of the work. We're expecting it to take at least 10 years, uh, probably longer for this to fully um, take hold in the church although in a way it should be just getting back to what we've always done I guess so um, but they're really big aims uh, for them and you'd have found those on the front of the ask me anything um, paperwork if you had time to look at that um, but basically we're aiming to um, eradicate discrimination which I think will only happen in heaven but we're aiming for it <laughs> that's what we're aiming for um, we're also aiming to sit at, for the church to be a place where diversity of people is celebrated rather than feared and valued um, rather than seen as a threat. Um, and we're aiming for a, a complete change. And this is why I want you um, to think if you want to show me your 10 fingers, if you can do that, naught being naught and 10 being 10. I'd be interested to know how much of a change. But what we were aiming for was a culture change so that anybody that wanted to could fully participate um, in any part of the church's life that they were called to. So on the assumption that God calls all sorts of people to all sorts of roles, and admittedly there will be some things people can't do for particular reasons and that's fine, but that where God is calling people, we want to be a church where everybody can fully participate in whatever it is that God's called them to. Now, for some people they say, we're there, we don't need a change, no change needed. <laughs> and I was always a bit suspicious when people said that to me, but I visited a few churches who said that, and some of them were doing it brilliantly, both rural and urban. Um, and then other people said, you know what, that would be 10, that would be a massive change. It would be a 10 out of 10 change. Uh, because at the moment, only people that look like this, talk like this, behave like this and understand this can do that role or that role. Um, rather than, uh, you know, we're willing to help anybody do whatever God is calling them to. So I don't know whether you want to do it or not. I can't see you all anyway, but just in your mind, maybe, how much of a change is this? Are we, you know, do we need three or four change? Is it a 10 out of 10 change we need? Or are we pretty much there? In which case we rejoice. Um, I'll leave that with you to think about. Oh, one or two people are putting their hands up, <laughs> showing their colours. It really, it's really, you know, that's just something for us to continue to think about really how much change is needed and it's a change we believe God's wanting to bring about um so that's where we are um I've got two minutes left Andrew <laughs> if anybody's put any questions in anywhere I don't can't see any in the chat um if there's like one or two questions we could do quickly at this point that things I said didn't make sense maybe we're going to talk in groups anyway, aren't we? So shall I just push on with that? Yeah. So we're going to ask you to go into smaller breakout groups now. I know we're not a massive um, number of people, but we're going to put you into breakout groups. The questions will be in the breakout rooms. But these are the questions we want you to consider together. What are the joys of being rural Christians who care about equality, diversity and inclusion? What are the joys of being rural Christians who care about equality, diversity and inclusion? And then two, what are the challenges about EDI work which you need to face in your context? What are the challenges about EDI work which you need to face in your context? And you can see that Catherine's put those in the chat line for you. So just before you go back in, um, it's a recurring thing whenever I'm involved in Zoom that people will sometimes say the breakout rooms were a bit of a waste of time because one or two people just took over. The very essence of this work is that we recognise that each person is important, each person's views are important, and that we can learn from them. <laughs> so remembering the guidance that you got earlier, um, if you can think, you've actually got 10 minutes, I think that's right, Andrew, is it? Or is it 15? 10. You've got 10 minutes, so if there are three of you, you've got about three minutes each. If there's four of you, you've got a bit less than that. So um, please take it in turns to speak and to listen, and very often somebody will think they don't have much to say until there's a bit of a pause and then they 
work out that perhaps they could join in. So um, I'll leave that with you and you've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So um, in the last introduction at the beginning, I was just talking about how sometimes we feel like we don't know um, who we know and who we don't know. We don't know much about people. You know, that experience where you think you know somebody and then you hear a story about their life that you had absolutely no sense of <laughs> until you managed to find time for a conversation. Um, basically, a lot of this work is about really good conversation. But when we were planning the work as a connectional team, we realised that actually sometimes people do need help. Um, with good conversation and it can be quite daunting um, speaking very personally about something about yourself which um, is deemed by others to be different or eccentric or unusual or of particular interest so um, what we don't want I suppose is people walking up to people and saying tell me about this um, or you're black tell me whatever um, that really wouldn't be that helpful but what we were trying to think of was how can we encourage people to get to know other people well so there's an, um, a tool online called Ask Me Anything. I don't know how much time people have had to do in terms of preparation. So we're going to have a little go at it for 20 minutes. Um, it's got four sides of A4 just as guidance. It tells you, um, I, don't, I might, I forgot to check if I can screen share. Can I screen share or not? Um, I'll just see if I can. Then That's screen shared, hasn't it? Um, so I'm just sharing with you what the guidance says. So basically, it's got the aims of the strategy. Um, it says that it's a way of learning from another person um, or from one another, I should say. That's not going to help you if it zooms up and down like that all the time. Uh, basically, you find somebody who might be classed as an expert by experience. And we're really glad to have Gabrielle with us today. We are actually all experts by experience, aren't we? Our experience makes us experts in a whole range of different things. So virtually anybody you know around you could be asked to do this and to be an expert by experience. But the difference with these sessions is that we're setting them up as a safe space in which we can hear from somebody and uh, have a conversation with them. And we're, we're hearing um, to listen and to learn. That's the main thing. So it's a safe space. Um, I think it's really important, the third diamond point there, that it's not an opportunity to challenge someone or debate different perspectives. So when we're hosting one, we need to make that clear at the beginning. And I'm just explaining that now. Um, but also recognising that by listening and through conversation, God can change our understanding and our perspective. And it's it's a learning experience. I don't know why my thing keeps jumping about like that. So there's a bit of a section there if anybody wants to offer to be an expert by experience. Um, and I won't go through that now. This is for all of us because we are attending an Ask Me Anything opportunity now. So we are asked to come with open hearts um, to make sure the safer space is safe and um, to show genuine interest um, and to ask the questions in order to learn. So we would love you to ask questions when we get to that point in this session. If you've got any questions for Gabriella, um, she'll help. Because I know that you're in rural contexts, for some rural contexts, gathering on Zoom like this works well. For some, it's much more difficult than in person. But if you do want to use digital as a way of gathering um, from uh, to meet people from other parts of the district, maybe, or the diocese, um, then you could use digitally like we are doing now. Um, and I just wanted to um, say that for the people who are being asked to be the expert, um, and Gabrielle and, have, and I have gone through this, you know, it's really important that we can ask anything, but Gabriella doesn't have to answer anything <laughs> if she doesn't want to. <laughs> so I think we're both highlighted now, which is great. We're going to have a little go at how this actually works. Um, so first of all, Gabriella, thank you very much indeed for offering to do this again. We've done it once before, haven't we? We have indeed, yes. <laughs> and it's lovely to have you present. Um, I'm going to, um, I've asked Gabriella because Gabriella told me at some point in a conversation that she had a neurodiverse condition. And uh, that's a thing which we're all learning more and more about. Um, in the past, people would have probably been seen as eccentric or difficult or uh, weird because they didn't necessarily think the way other people did and now we're learning more and more about why that happens and the value of understanding each other um, in our different ways of thinking so thank you for coming along to do it um, what we'd always do in a session and I'm going to do it now as we move into this session is to pray for the person because um, they're a gift from God so let's just pray for a moment 
God of love, we thank you that we are all different and that each one of us is made in your image. We thank you for Gabriella's willingness to share with us today. And we ask that as we listen to her experience, as we, as we find the space and the time to ask things that maybe we have been wondering or that we wonder from what she says. Our wondering and our listening will help us to learn more of her and more of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Gabriella, we're giving you five minutes to introduce yourself. It's not long. Normally, we'd have a bit longer than this, um, but we're doing a very short one today. So, five minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your story. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, welcome everybody that um, it's a really good opportunity to uh, share and to learn from others as well. Um, I was born in Germany, as many of you know, and I've always felt a bit uh, different, a bit other. And I thought it was just me, so I just carried on. And when I was born 60 odd years ago, neurodiversity was not even, uh, I don't think even anybody thought about it. People were just a bit awkward and pull up your socks if you can't cope with it and just get on with it kind of thing. Um, when I was in my 20s, I moved to the UK and um, all my difficulties I thought were from my German upbringing. And I thought maybe it's because I was born in a very social democratic way and now I moved into a monarchy that I'm not quite fitting in. And it was a very difficult time until I realized uh, that I am on the uh, autistic scale. I am part of the neurodiverse community that is, uh, I think, growing in the UK now. Uh, it showed itself in many ways, um, not really being comfortable in social settings. And um, when I was called by God to come to, uh, to him, I... I had a very strong feeling that, yes, this is where I need to be, but the people around, uh, and this is why the diversity program is so important, the people around and within the churches were a little bit off. They were com not complaining, but they were judging, judgmental, um, saying, oh, you mustn't do that and you mustn't do this. And my probation time was so flawed that I had a breakdown and I was transferred to another place to finish my training. So I basically, I was a probationer twice. But now with hindsight, I realize all of these problems stem from the fact that I am slightly differently wired. Um, I have absolutely fantastic skills, but there are some things I just simply do not get like, Social interaction, I still struggle with that. Um, I read people very well, but I, I'm not quite sure if I interact in a way that people sometimes feel comfortable. I was called bossy and directive and authoritative, all of these things. And I internalized that and I try to be different. But it is only now in my, I think, 13th year of ministry that I am allowing myself to be who I am. And here in the Lincolnshire district, it is very, very welcomed, which is lovely because uh, I can finally be the person that God has called to ministry. And it is, it is lovely. Uh, I have a very supportive team. They all know about, uh, about the neurodiversity. They know about all sorts of other things about me as well, but still they're welcoming me and they're still loving and kind and supportive. I am very bad at organizing myself and managing time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I get help. Our administrator, ever so often she checks my diary, which we share, and she says, this is in the wrong place and you need to change that time, et cetera, et cetera. And I am so pleased with that. And she felt really awkward doing that for me because, oh, but you're the minister and I don't want to step on your toes, but I welcome that kind of help because I know where my weaknesses are. So it's about learning 
about oneself and asking for help, that is a really big thing. I am fiercely independent, but I have learned to ask for help when I know I need it, especially for, for work and for, for the good of the churches that I serve. I now have the wonderful opportunity to be a superintendent, which is another cuttle of fish altogether because I now have to deal with things like complaints and I'm not very good at confrontation, but I'm learning it. And I will have to have a very serious conversation with somebody soon. And I will have to tell him that he cannot be a visiting preacher because he's just not the kind of person that the Methodist church welcome without training. So uh, that's gonna be tough, but I know that God will guide me and give me the right words. And that is the one thing that I have always relied on since God has picked me up. I always, always, always ask God for help and guidance and uh, direction. And I have learned that people are fallible, we all are, but God never is. God is always steadfast and always true. So that's where my strength really anchors. And in God, we can move mountains. But uh, neurodiversity is not a condition, it's not an illness, it's just a different way of looking at life. Thank you, Gabrielle. And you put me right in that sense, because I think I did use neurodivergent condition. And as I used it, I was thinking, hang on, is that the right word? So one of the things that we've definitely said with the EDI work is that nobody is going to get this right. None of us are experts. Uh, we can't be experts on everything. We're all experts on something, but we can't all be experts on everything. <laughs> so we are always learning from each other. And that's why, actually, just as an aside, there's only a one module so that we can just get into our heads that sort of basic approach to EDI. But then we have to carry on learning. And this is one way of doing it. So thank you. Um, I'll say something else at the end about the lovely introduction you gave us. But what we then would do is to just say, having met Gabriella a little bit, and she's opened herself up to questions. If you'd like to put a question, either put your hand up and Catherine can, or Andrew can tell us who has got their hands up, or just put it into the chat line. And it can be any question at all. So you've got a few minutes to start asking some questions. So Catherine has a question for us. What has been the most challenging aspect of your experience? Uh, the most challenging aspect I believe for me was to accept myself as I am because God loves me and God has picked me up as I am. So if other people don't quite get me, I no longer fret about it. And that was a very, very hard lesson because it's everybody likes to be liked. And I was really working hard on being liked to the expense of my own self. So uh, that was a really hard lesson to learn. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to wait for other questions to come in, uh, but just wanted to comment while we're going along that actually, um, when we put this learning tool forward, we hadn't really predicted this, but every time anybody's done it, it's been really moving testimony from my point of view, <laughs> you know, because you're hearing the person's story and you're hearing um, who it is that uh, that God has called and, uh, and that each of us is different. Are there any other questions? Has anybody got their hand up if they didn't want to put one in the chat line? It's the first time you've been to an Ask Me Anything, so you're probably not used to asking questions in this way, but... And I can assure anybody I will not be offended by any question. I would love to share my experience so uh, we can learn from it. Denise has a question. Hi, hi, Gabrielle. Um, I didn't know your story. Of Gabrielle and I were uh, probationers in the same district way back when, but I didn't know uh, your story, Gabrielle. And I'm so, so happy that you've been able to share that with us today. Uh, what was, but I wanted to know what was, what could have been done better for you during those, those early years? Um, um, what, what did you think, you know, could have been different for you? Um, accepting me as a person and in the general direction accepting people as they are and if there is something that doesn't quite 
meet with Methodist standards to have a very gentle conversation about it, direct, not through the uh, Blume, as we say in Germany, but direct. Uh, directness is a really important thing about uh, neurodiverse people. Uh, speaking around doesn't work. It, it has to be direct. And um, most people will not be offended. Neurodiverse people, autistic people, uh, ADHD people, they prefer directness uh, when it comes from a place of love. To be too cautious and too careful and, oh, I might upset somebody, that doesn't work because directness is really important. And if I had that kind of approach then, um, I, I think I would have thrived more and I would not have had the breakdown and I would not have had the, the problems I had then. And for future um, candidates, maybe that is a way forward to, maybe there will be courses soon, for, uh, especially about how to deal with neuro, uh, people, no, neurodiverse people, always yes. a condition first and then the person because it's an autistic person, not a person with autism. Um, and if that is embraced into the training, that might help so many people, because who knows, we can sit next to somebody and that person could be autistic somewhere on the scale. Um, we Gabrielle, you know, you said you were happy for us to be direct. I'm going to jump in at that point. Just yeah. to, the good news is that they are massively better at it in the Methodist Church now. I think I think cause we've all learned a lot. I think somebody with your experience would not have the same problems that's a bit of a bold statement but I do think that's true actually that we've got much better at asking people so I've put into the chat line the um, guidance for having those conversations with everybody because the other thing is we can't assume well this person has a support need and that person doesn't so what we're asking people to do with all their teams is just to have a conversation and there's some guidelines for how that could work if yeah. you if you discover that you do need to make some adjustments according to the um, Disability Act and so on. Um, there's a question from Andrew, Gabrielle, which is, has, yeah. have you found the rural community less or more supportive of those living with neurodiversity? I'm presuming Andrew means than the urban one. <laughs> have you found the rural community less or more supportive? More supportive in my experience. Uh, I mean, this is my first rural uh, setting uh, the rest was all uh, urban, small town kind of settings. But yeah, this here is more supportive of the person that I am, uh, which is great. They can see all of the visions I have, and they're very keen to work out if we can implement them, etc. Whereas in the more urban settings, it was very, uh, this is a way we do it. Let's not rock the boat and let's not change it and uh, pushing a cart with three wheels and holding one corner up all the time is very hard work, but uh, it's much better if a cart is pulled with four wheels, because that way um, we can move forward faster. I'm not sure if that analogy is clear enough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there, I think we've got time for one more question, if anybody would um, want to ask anything. If not, we'll move on. But is, are there, is there any more? Oh, yes, Hermione. Hi, Gabrielle. Thank you for sharing your experience. I, I, I just have a question about something that you, you just said about talking about people as an autistic person rather than a person with autism and saying that it should be an autistic person, whereas <coughs> I guess my, my, my understanding up to, up to now has been that it would be a person with autism. Could you just explain about that, please? Uh, there is a doctor in the Brighton uh, circuit. Uh, he is a medical doctor in the hospital at Brighton and he has autism. And there is a very, very good chat about his experience on the internet. And he says, it is not a person with something because autism is not something additional to the person. It is the person. The, the, the autistic person is the person. 
and uh, he is he is a really really good advocate for for um autistic people that they can achieve anything that they set their hearts uh, on providing there is the support that they need he's got a uh, sound blocking earphones uh, given to him he's got a space where he can disappear to when he is uh, too stressed and all of these little things make all the difference for uh, an autistic person so it, it's it's to be aware of the needs and uh, autistic people are very happy to share what they need. Thank you. It's a really interesting question. Well, let's finish this first and then I'll, I'll say those things afterwards. So um, you've got a bit of a feel for it, I hope. Um, it's each time we've used it, it's we've learned a little bit more about it. Uh, but I think it's a really, really good tool. Um, and mostly, well, no, I'm going to ask Gabriella. Well, I think we'll pray first, Gabriella, for you, which is what I'd always do at the end of a session. Um, and then um, we'll just ask you how it was for you on this occasion. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being with us as we have listened and heard and learned about Gabriella's life and your working in it and through it. We thank you for all that she's brought to the church and all that she's willing to give of herself. We thank you for her valuing of herself and we pray that um, we too may value ourselves and may value one another. So we thank you for this time together in this particular session and we ask that we may continue to think on what we have heard and to hear from you how we could put change into practice. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And um, Gabriella, is there anything you just wanted to say to people as an expert by experience, how you know how you've found it or what's been particularly important or helpful or necessary to be able to do it? Uh, I find it very, very helpful for myself because uh, look, sounding and listening to the questions it gives me an understanding where the majority of people are and that might be the wrong phrase but where uh, people are within churches in regards of understanding of neurodiversity and where they are so I can then hopefully breach the gap and get people more um, into the know as it were it's it's important to know where people are and for people to know where I am and this gap that is there needs to be bridged and it is being bridged by questioning and answering and being honest with one another and not to be afraid uh, to ask, not to be afraid to ask. And if you see somebody in your congregation who is always separating themselves, always sitting alone and they may do it out of um, comfort because I like a very large uh, personal space but some people are too afraid to sit somewhere close and they need to be invited so just to be aware of these little tiny nuances is very important and each time I answer and uh, when I am the expert by experience and the um, ask me anything situations it gives me an understanding where others are as well as well as others get an understanding where I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in a minute, we're going to talk about how people may be able to use that or not. Um, just wanted to make a quick couple of observations. The question that um, somebody asked about language is interesting because there's an inclusive language guide in Methodism and it uses the people first approach, um, you know, that we are all people and we put that first. So it's a really pertinent question. And there's been change in disability group thinking and different disability groups have different views on that um, and the reason we produced an inclusive language guide was not to say this is what you should say or this is what you should not say but just to emphasize that like anything the main the main clue key um to, to talking is actually listening and asking people <laughs> what they find helpful so it is difficult you know we can't always get it right but we can keep learning and i think it will keep changing so yeah. we, we may need to change the um, inclusive language guide. 
Um, I was just asking Andrew whether we want to. We were going to go into breakout groups before now, but I'm just thinking, do we need to do that, Andrew? What do you reckon? Yeah, happy if you if we want if you're ha ha happy to host a, a general conversation together. There's not so many of us. I think we could manage that probably. I mean, we've got another twenty minutes left, haven't we? Just under because we need to, add, you know, do a couple of ending things. So I'm thinking maybe we just go into the gallery um, thing again. Catherine, I've taken over accidentally, but um, and then we can Fine. we can have a conversation together. Um, I think. So the questions we we're going to ask you are um, your feedback on that as a learning tool. Um, but also just well, let, let's start with that. So what have you learned from that exercise, if anything? And you feel free to say, I think it's a rubbish model. Somebody did do that at one of them. <laughs> so, oh, I don't think that would work where I am. <laughs> so that's OK if you feel like saying that. <laughs> um, it's definitely not rocket science, is it? But it's just basically brokering a positive conversation. So um, what have you learned that might help you? And, you know, do you think this particular model may or may not help in your own context? Let's have a conversation about that. What do you think? This is why I think we should have had breakout rooms because now nobody's talking. <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, I, I found it I found it really helpful and really interesting. I think that that opportunity to ask the questions that it's a bit like the question Hermione asked. I, I'm always fearful of tripping up myself with language. And so just to be able to have that honest, you know, this is what I'm really not sure what I should be saying here. What is the right thing to say? And somebody um, answering it from that perspective of, 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 of being an expert. I, I just found that really helpful. So thank you for that. I noticed Gabriella said at one point, I'm not sure if this is the right thing to say, but this is what I'm, and then she had a go. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because people can always put you right. And if you start by saying, put me right if I get the language wrong, but <laughs> Hermione? Yeah, I mean, I think from the point of view of it being a safe space, that's a really helpful um, thing to, a model to have. I was having a, a conversation with somebody um, at the weekend and um, she was talking about her experience with her children um, and all of the conversation around um, the different kind of gender uh, classifications and everything and, and how that impacts with people in reality. Um, and the one thing we were saying is so many of us don't want to start the conversation because we're fearful of using the wrong language, of saying the wrong thing. So having um, a safe space like this, Ask Me Anything, I think is, is, a, is a really good model because you're hopefully in a space where you can say, actually, look, I really don't know how to say this or where, where to start, but at least you've got that opportunity to do so. Thank you. Caroline? I think picking up on what Gabrielle said, which is, you know, actually being direct with a person and being willing to... And then that brokers a relationship about how you might help one another or, you know, and perspectives, isn't it, really? I think that's um, just thinking about people that we've got in our congregations, you know, a couple of really autistic people who, because they're of the generation that weren't diagnosed as autistic, they're just seen as obstreperous. And you're going, well, actually, let's just think about this and how, you know, we might help them and support them rather than sort of ridiculing them really I think that's I think particularly for the generation where it's not seen or people haven't yet been diagnosed I think that's the problem isn't it you have a tag of being awkward rather than actually you are a person really. Caroline I, I've had three experiences of talking to older people um, like because I have had quite a lot of contact with people with autism just thinking actually as Gabriella said you can't generalize for everybody but but <laughs> I was just about to do it. You, can, <laughs> you can't universalize it. <laughs> but generally, I have found that people with autism are very happy to have a direct, straightforward conversation. And with three older people who I knew wouldn't have been diagnosed when they were younger, 
when they've been, you know, falling out with X number of people for the X number of times. I've said, has anybody ever talked to you? You know, I don't know if you've picked up in the news, but there's been a lot more awareness of, of autism recently. Is it a thing you've ever thought of? And I was really, really nervous the first time I did it. And by the end of the conversation, the man was just almost in tears about it and said, you know, I just have never thought about that, but it would explain so much. Um, and I've had similar, I think you have to be really careful, I suppose, but because people are happy to be direct, usually, you know, you're not saying that they have got autism and they're not, you're not saying it necessarily matters. Um, you know, I mean, that's the other interesting, isn't it? As somebody close to me in my family is just going for an autism diagnosis. And we had a conversation about what will happen if the diagnosis comes back negative, because um, what difference does our diagnosis make or not make? It's about understanding ourselves, isn't it? So that's a whole other question. Um, Carla, did you want to say that thing about the, that you've been putting in the chat line about there? I just wondered, Gabrielle, um, what would your feelings be about using language such as um, you, um, a person with lived experience of X that might be autism, it might be depression, it might be whatever. Is that is that helpful language or not in your experience? I think Gabriella's you muted. Were you able to answer that now, Gabriella, or not? You're muted. Yeah, my, my daughter just asked if I wanted an espresso, so I, I didn't quite hear the, sorry. No, they, they, they're important questions, uh, but I, I wondered what your feeling was around using language such as a person with lived experience of X, it may be autism, it may be depression, is, is that helpful language or not, in your, in your um, opinion? No, personally, I don't find that very helpful because it's too broad. Okay. It's uh, perhaps something like, um, well, direct, uh, what, are, is, what is your experience in this, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I just, I just wondered what your, your view was. I think it does raise the question, Carla, of how you advertise these things. So we realised at the last one we did in person that we mm -hmm. hadn't talked about how we would advertise it. Mm -hmm. And I initially wanted to call it Meet a Methodist. <laughs> on the basis that you know I'm a Methodist minister and Methodism is very very broad and I want people to celebrate the differences and just meet just have lots and lots of different Methodists come because mm -hmm. all of us have got something that we could talk about that other people won't have experienced and um, but then it, we didn't want it only to be very Methodist so we didn't call it that <laughs> Um, but I think it is a bit tricky to know how to have you know somebody offered to do one about their experience of addiction um, but then advertising, you know, publicly, that was a really helpful session that we had. But to have advertised it very public as Lee has come and, you know, meet this person who's got this particular addiction, is that um, is that fair? Is it safe? Is that helpful? So there's, there is an interesting question, I think, about how you advertise it, um, who you let know, how you, how you describe it. And I don't think we've got the answer to that. So if anybody's got any, any helpful suggestions, that would be good, because we haven't even covered that in the guidance, actually, and I think it probably needs to go in there. Well, any any question <clears throat> any question or any uh, workshops regarding um, substance abuse and addiction, uh, there are many helpful agencies out there, and uh, uh, Alcoholics or Drug Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, the twelve step programs are really very helpful, and there is somebody Deacon. Oh, forgotten her name. His name is uh, Tracy, isn't it? Tracy, he, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, they're doing a really, really good job on making um, uh, addiction problems uh, uh, part of the mainstream conversation these days, which is a really wonderful thing to see. Mm. Andrew? Yeah, I just had a question, really. I, I, I really appreciated the session. I'm just thinking about, you know, how we translate that into our own context. And I suppose one of the things that's kind of flagging up for me is if you were to do this sort of, you know, do the, the ask, ask anything kind of session and you pick on a particular person and a particular um, because of their experience, do you then... Would, you, would the idea be that you ran a series of these, looking at different things? Otherwise, it would feel a bit as if, are you just targeting or picking on that particular thing? Just, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. sense. So what somebody said to me, you know, we've been talking about the whole 
transgender issue because for so many people they feel they don't understand it they don't know anybody who's talked to them about it um and he said i'm going to organize one of these and it was in a session just like this but in person and as a group we, we came to the conclusion with him that he needed to make it broader so there was a series in my own circuit I'm thinking well maybe do six set 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 six up <laughs> you know maybe once a, one every two months and just advertise them as come and meet Gabrielle and then ask her for a sentence or two about herself which explains why you know what she'll be talking about and we if you did that with people from different experiences that would be good um there is the real problem of lumping everybody. One of the things I've loved about this model is you're meeting a person. It's a bit like when you do a funeral, if any of you take funerals, you know, where it's such a gift that you're, you're such a privilege, isn't it, to, to tell the story of what God's done in the life of a person, because that life is it's absolutely unique and precious. And um, I've, I'm not saying I've just taken Gabriella's funeral. <laughs> But there is that sort of sense of, you know, celebrating people <laughs> while they're with us. And, and each one of those will be different, but they will. So I think you do have to, I think it's particularly, I, so I'm waffling a lot now. I care a lot about anti-racism. That's why I came into this work, actually. It wasn't particularly around disability or sexuality or neurodiversity. It was about racism that I came into this work. Um, and there's a real, you know, if you think how many different ethnicities there are and how many billions of trillions of people I don't know the maths there are in the world <laughs> you can't generalize but you can learn from particular people as long as you don't then make the assumption that everybody that looks the same has got the same experience that's the thing isn't it and um, Andrew I'm just wondering if we could move on because we've got another five minutes or so um we we I'm glad we used this particular learning tool um but we did want to give you a chance to ask any questions generally about equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, the line the Methodist Church has taken, and this hasn't been the same in all the denominations, is to say, and it, I think it partly came about from resource issues. So back in the day, we would have had a women's secretary, we'd have had a racial justice secretary, we would have had a disability advisor, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't have all those things, but the absolute joy we have found um, of only having one or two people paid <laughs> is that it's made us look at the whole issue of diversity together and there is a danger with that that you can lose some of the particularities but at the same time it helps you see what happens generally um, and consistently which is that we assume people should be like us you know I'm shorthanding here we assume people should behave in a particular way in the church we therefore other it's called isn't it when we you know we I, I try really hard to get people to think not about us and them but one another try not to use the other person but one another because that's how Jesus was I think that we're in one body um so we have been we have been trying to look at at, at how human beings behave and how God wants human beings to behave but are there any questions <laughs> generally last few minutes I, I just wondered Jill you, you shared a little story when we were in the breakout room about it, it's good to hear some good news of how this is actually yeah so I, I love the job I had I mean it's a pretty big uh, in some ways it's a pretty big challenge but I loved it when people sent me good news stories and somebody um from the Stanford area wrote to me and said I, I know you'll be getting lots of criticism about the EDI training so I just wanted to tell you it's changed my church completely so I rang her because I was sort of excited about this <laughs> And she said, well, we did the EDI module and learned about the disability uh, and the discrimination acts and what we may or may not be doing wrong. And we realised that we had a blind member of our church who we'd never asked to do the Bible reading. Nobody had ever thought, would she like to do the Bible reading? So we asked this blind lady, would you like to do the Bible reading? And she was absolutely in tears about it and said, I'd love to, but it never occurred to me I could. I assumed it was the same people that had to do the Bible readings. So nobody had ever said that, but because it was always the same four or five people that got asked, <laughs> she'd assumed she couldn't. And she'd been in the church quite a long time. So she started to do the Bible readings. And then other people who were newcomers, um, including one or two asylum seekers who'd been moved out there for some reason into this village, said, oh, well, can we do the Bible readings? So she said, actually, then we had a much more team of 
diverse team of Bible readers. And she said two or three of those people then said, well, can we do, can we be stewards as well? Are we allowed to be stewards? And it was, a, are we allowed to be? <laughs> and because nobody had sort of encouraged them or asked them what they would like to do. So she said, actually, the church literally has changed because we heard that we were being discriminatory from the law point of view and realised we should open it up. Um, so I was really chuffed by that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great story. Any any other any other questions or comments for for Jill? May I share a good news story? Please do. Yeah. Um, in our chapel, which is churches together in Dunstan, the everything that we do is as a uh, one church, but with two different worship areas: chapel and church. Uh, we have a lot of um, farm workers from Romania uh, in the area. And they came to chapel once and they really were warmly welcomed and we did some weird translation with mobile phones. And then I thought, well, they are local. Let's get a dictionary. And um, the other day they came back for a, an afternoon tea session and the dictionary was pulled mm -hmm. out and it was so much easier to talk to people uh, because they don't speak English and we don't speak Romanian. But having that dictionary there uh, was a really, really good thing that uh, that we were able to show, look, we are willing to welcome you and we are willing to learn a bit of your language. We've got a dictionary now, so let's communicate. And they were lovely, lovely people. It was such a success because uh, it's a completely different culture, different language and everything. But in Christ, we were all one. And that is really lovely. Thank you for that. What a great story. Thank you. And a good good story of rural community as well and being a welcoming place. That's really positive. OK, we've, we've another minute or two if anyone else has got a question or a comment. Otherwise, we'll go on to our final um, devotions. I'll be really quick if other people have got questions, but I did just want to say that the people putting the Methodist strategy together were really conscious that rural life is often marginalised <laughs> and is a diversity in itself. So um, there's that kind of richness that we want rural communities to feed in and that learning between city and town and village, I think is really important. Um, and there's a risk assessment. I know, uh, sorry, not a risk assessment, an equality assessment. I know some people hate risk assessments, but if you've got in the habit of doing risk assessment in whatever way works for you, because we know it's good to make sure that we're keeping people safe, um, either in written form or just in habit of thinking or whatever it is verbally. You can do the same thing with a quality impact assessment. You know, you can ask yourselves who might we be leaving out here? Um, who have we actively included? How could we do this differently? So a, a friend of mine in a village church has got um, a lad who we're not supposed to say severely autistic now Gabriella are we um he has autism and multiple other disabilities and can't communicate at all really and she said to me when she became part of this work I had never ever realized we were being discriminated against it was just my life we just got on with it and I've realized that actually although people said we're doing this uh, you can come do come along if you can Nobody ever said, how could we do this so that Jimmy would enjoy it? How could we do this so that he was at the centre of it for a change? You know, how can, how could we? So actually that thinking, who might we be excluding by the way we do things, I think is a really important question. Um, there's, there is a form for it if you like doing that kind of thing. But when we started introducing it, people were saying, yeah, we need to put rural on there as well. If we're a circuit or if we're a deanery, you know, how are we leaving out the rural churches? by the way we organise things or the way we do things. So, we, you know, you are experts on that. <laughs> Thank you. We are going to need to, to go together really quick, Gabrielle, if that's OK. Yep, very, very quick. For anybody who has got communication difficulties, the Makaton system might be a really good thing to be using. Makaton, as you say, uh, it's uh, written down, as you say, it with a K. And it is a symbol-based language program that you can uh, buy from the makaton.org.uk and that might help people with uh, uh, communication difficulties. Uh, it doesn't work on Apple, 
So I have not been able to use it yet, but it's a really, really good program. I used to use it before I became a minister. Thank you. Yeah, Makaton's great. Okay, yeah. thank you very much to Gabrielle and to Jill for their time and sharing. Um, all the stuff that we've talked about, all the links and that will, will be in chat and we'll make sure we send that round afterwards. Um, but we're just going, I'm going to hand over to Caroline, um, who's going to draw things together for us. So uh, it's been really good to have the time to share together. And uh, the one thing we are all experts at is, is, is as a rural practitioner. Um, so as a group, we're looking at uh, future uh, webinars. Um, so in January, 16th of January, uh, we're looking at dementia and Anna chaplaincy. Uh, and then in April, looking at how we might prepare for our church presence at uh, agricultural shows, uh, big fates or whatever is going on in your communities. And to that end, uh, we're putting a plea uh, for your experiences uh, on what you've done and good practice. Uh, it will come out in the survey if you can offer any either somebody you know who does good things or the good things that each of us might be doing within our own communities. Um, so that we can get that experience and knowledge and broaden that as well. So as we offer the time that we've had together, uh, but also by the gift of this spirit in our conversation and how we um, attend to one another in our communities uh, and all that we are, uh, we just take a moment to pause thinking about what we might do next after hearing what we've heard this morning um, and the people that come to mind. So Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks that each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made and that each of us may use our God-given charisms in the service of Christ, in our worship, in our communities, and all that we do. But also that we may be attentive one to another, and those in our congregations and communities, be attentive to their needs, and be encouragers that each of us may flourish in God's love day by day. We offer this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. So thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, whatever else we've got to do today. We just thank you for being with us. <laughs>